joining this lecture. Uh, today, Professor Mudlu cannot be here, so he asked me to uh, deliver this lecture today about SIMD processors and tomorrow's lecture about GPUs. Uh, we talked today about the different uh, paradigm of execution, something that is new to you, because the way that we are going to make our computers, computers faster is different as before. Remember that you started with a very with the design of a very simple machine, something that is called the von Neumann machine, where you have a memory, you have some processing elements, or maybe one or more, and they are connected through a memory bus, right? Uh, you learn how to build something as simple as a <clears throat> single <clears throat> single cycle processor uh, for um, 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 the MIPS instruction set or the LC3 instruction set. And after that, Professor Mutlu start ex started to explain how to do it better, how to do it faster. So for example, how to execute at the same time instructions that are completely independent of each other. If that happens in your code, then you can execute these inst instructions in parallel and hopefully you can make your program much faster, right? And the uh, ways of doing that are, for example, dividing the whole data path into multiple pieces and execute part of one instruction in each of these pieces at the same time. That's what we call pipelining. Uh, first of all, he started with in-order processors. After that, he made everything more complicated with out-of-order processors that are even smarter and are able to extract by themselves instruction-level parallelism. That's what I'm talking about, right? Today, we are going to talk about a very special type of instruction level parallelism that is based on the fact that workloads handle very large amount of data and many, many times the computation that we have to apply on every single data instance is exactly the same. That's what we call data level parallelism. And that's uh, you know, the type of parallelism that the SIMD processors and the GPUs are very good at exploiting. Um, yeah, I'm not very comfortable, but I will continue. So um, this is a way of making the processors faster, same as other possible ways that you have learned in the last few lectures, like data flow, superscalar execution, very long instruction word, uh, systolic arrays, uh, decouple access execute. I think that these are these have been the latest lecture that we premiered today. Uh, we talk about SIMD processors, and tomorrow we will talk about graphics processing units that are, let's say, the most representative type of SIMD processors these days in the real world. Um, what we are going to cover and explain today and tomorrow, uh, in reality or in principle, uh, it's uh, related to these two main parts of the um, of the computing stack. Give me one second. I might be doing something wrong here or this is simply uncomfortable. Okay. So um, yeah, let's start with SIMD processors. These are the readings for this week. Required one is the first one about the NVIDIA Tesla architecture. You will see like uh, what was the first um, uh, architecture from NVIDIA capable of performing GPU computing general purpose processing. It's a very nice paper, very well detailed, even though the architecture of the GPUs have evolved a lot in the recent years, but still this uh, paper uh, has like the uh, basic uh, the components very nicely explained. And the second one, it's probably something that we are also going to discuss today briefly is are the MMX extensions in Intel processors. These are, let's say that the type of CIMD processing that we can find in regular CPUs these days, or at least like the, the preliminary type of uh, CIMD processing in, in these uh, CPUs. So as I said before, uh, GPUs and CIMD processors are good at, are good at exploiting data level parallelism. Data level parallelism essentially consists, as I said before, that you have many different data instances and you want to apply the same computation on all these data instances. This is something that is not uncommon. You can think about image processing, for example. As you know, images are essentially two-dimensional organizations of pixels. And it's very frequent that we apply exactly the same computation on every single pixel of the image. That's just one example. You can take a look at uh, most uh, artificial intelligence and neural networks today, and you will see that the amount of uh, the, the type of computation that we perform there is also very regular. And in those cases, there is where uh, CIMD processors and, and GPUs um, are good at. 
So especially good if this uh, data parallelism is regular, meaning that we are applying exactly the same computation at the same time uh, on different data, right? In some cases, we will see that the computation is not so regular, for example, because the memory accesses are not so regular, or maybe because there is some sort of uh, control flow divergence across the different uh, execution units that operate in parallel. But in principle, we are going to assume that everything is very regular. Very basic example, think about the vector addition, right? You have two very long arrays of millions of elements and the computation that you have to perform on every single element is just reading one element from uh, array A, one element from array B, adding them and writing. That's very regular computation. Ac memory accesses are regular and uh, operation itself that you have to execute on every single data instance is exactly the same. So that's the kind of uh, regularity that we are talking about. Uh, this type of, or this class of processors called SIMD processors were uh, first classified by uh, Mike, uh, Mike Fling in this uh, taxonomy of computers in 1966, where he uh, proposed uh, four different types of processors. First one is called SISD, single instruction, single data. You are applying one single instruction on every uh, single data at, uh, at, at, at a given time, right? That's what is uh, essentially a sequential processor, same as the uh, in order or out of order processors that you have seen um, in previous lectures. The uh, class that we are going to discuss today in detail is SIMD, single instruction, multiple data. We have a single instruction that, or a single a stream of instructions that are operating on multiple streams of data. And you will see uh, the you know, different types of SIMD processors. Today, we are going to talk about two simple ones, array processors and vector processors. There are many similarities uh, among them, and you'll see as well tomorrow that uh, GPUs in the end are a combination of both vector and array processors. We can also talk about multiple instructions, single data. The most, the closest thing that we are covering in this course uh, to this uh, MISD class are the systolic arrays. You, might remember them from a previous lecture. And finally, we have MIMD. Multiple instructions operate on multiple data. The closest thing to these are multiprocessors, multi-core processors, or multi-thread processors that we have uh, in our computers or in our cell phones um, these days. Um, okay, so uh, over the course of the lecture, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and ask questions if uh, you need to discuss anything with me. Okay, so MIMD processors as, are, as I said, the last uh, class in this taxonomy of computers. And this is the uh, paper from Mike Fling, and this is the example of a MISD processor. And that's why we can say that the closest thing is uh, uh, the, the, the systolic arrays. As you may remember from the systolic, uh, from the lecture of uh, systolic arrays, you have different execution units and observe that there is a single stream of data and, uh, and in these multiple execution units, we are executing different instructions on the same stream of data. So that's why we call it a MISD. This is the lecture about systolic arrays. And this is the example of a SIMD machine uh, that uh, proposes uh, Mike Fling. Um, there is a single instruction unit because we are executing the same instruction, observe how we are communicating the same instruction to all the execution units that are operating on different data elements accessed from this uh, operand storage. And this is more or less the, at, um, you know, like the basic scheme of the uh, uh, type of processors that we are going to discuss today. So there we go. Data parallelism. In data parallelism, as I mentioned before, concurrency arises for, from performing the same operation on different pieces of data. So that's why we call it single instruction, multiple data. Dot product of two vectors is one possible example. Uh, observe that this contrasts with uh, data flow. In data flow, we ex extract the concurrency from performing different operations in parallel, right? In a data-driven manner. And also contrasts with uh, threat or control parallelism is what we can have, for example, in a multi-core CPU where we have multiple threads and each thread is running on a different core and they are doing completely different things on completely 
uh, different um, data, but um, they are uh, in the end exploiting some sort of parallelism as well. So that's why it's different. SIMD exploits operation level parallelism or instruction level parallelism on different pieces of data where all the instructions executed in parallel are exactly the same. So single instruction, multiple data. And this parallelism, this concurrency might happen either in time or in a space. The simplest thing that you can you know, think about is like uh, you have multiple processing elements and in all these processing elements, you execute the same instruction at the same time, right? That's only one type of uh, SIMD processor. That's what we call an array processor indeed. Uh, because there is here uh, this uh, time space duality. In the array processor, same instruction operates on multiple data elements at the same time in different spaces, while in the vector processor, the same instruction operates on multiple data elements in consecutive time steps using the same unit, using the same space. Um, in order to make use of these uh, array or vector processors and these execution units, you need to have the data somewhere, right? In principle, the data resides in memory, but at some point we need to bring it closer to the execution units. And the place where we put the data, we put the different data elements that we access from memory are registers, same as in any other type of processor. But here we need longer registers. Why is that? Because we are, no, we are going to operate on many elements at the same time. So all these many elements should be, should be together or close to each other in something that we call the vector register. So imagine, for example, that our computer operates on 32-bit integer values. This M here would be 32, but at the same time, we want to operate on N elements at the same time. So that's why, as you see here, we have a vector register that contains n individual registers of size m bytes, right? And if we want to perform an addition, for example, we need two vector uh, registers that are the input operands, and these are v0 and v1. And as you can see here, we may even have a single execution unit. What we do is like every single cycle, we fetch one element from v0, one element from v1, and we start the addition. And with the cycle, one cycle later, we go to the next element, right? So that's the most basic uh, vector processor that you can think about. And, um, and that's what we um, also see in this slide. But here, uh, we make already this, this distinction, or we are going to make this distinction between array processors and vector processors. Observe that uh, this is our uh, program, is our first SIMD program. Uh, what we are doing, first of all, is loading some data coming from memory, array A, into a vector register, VR. Next, we add one to every element in the vector register, VR. Then we perform one multiplication, uh, the content, different contents of VR times two, and then we store the uh, result in the original uh, location in memory. How do we execute this simple code on these two types of two types of um, uh, CIMD processors. First of all, in the array processor, we have in this simple case or this uh, simple example, we have four processing elements. And this means that we can, and these processing elements, as you see, are all the same, right? So this means that in every single cycle, we can, we can start the execution of one instruction on the four uh, processing elements at the same time, because we have to operate on four elements of array A. First thing to do is loading a0 to A3, and we use the four uh, processing elements to do so. One cycle later, we can issue the addition, next, the multiplication, and finally, the store operation. In the case of the vector processor, observe that um, we have different types of processing elements. I told you in the previous slide, the simplest uh, type or the simplest uh, way of building a, a, a vector processor is having just a single compute unit and or, or ALU, as you saw in the previous slide, and every single cycle we start the execution of a new instruction, right? In this case, we are assuming that we have different uh, uh, processing elements for different purposes, as you see. One unit is for loading, adding, multiplying, and storing. So first cycle, we can start the execution of the load operation for the first element that we need to read from 
uh, from array A, from, uh, to read A0. So we start um, here, loading A0, then we start loading A1, but we can also uh, start the addition as, as soon as we get A0 from memory, and then uh, in this cycle, L, uh, LD2, uh, adding on the, on the, on the first, on, on element one and multiplying element zero and so on and so forth until we finish. Uh, look at the difference. In the case of the array processor, we are executing the same operation at the same time. While in the vector processor, we execute different operations at the same time, in the same cycle. Why is that? Because the parallelism is obtained from uh, executing different instructions on different units that our processor has. And also in a space, uh, in the case of the array processor, we have different operations executed in the same space, in the same processing element, while in the vector processor, the uh, execution units are specialized. And that's why we always execute the same operation in the same space. So now you already know the most uh, basic type of SIMD processor that can be either an array processor or a, um, a vector processor. And as you can see as well, these two types of processors are different from uh, very long instruction word processors that you have seen in a previous lecture, because there, there is also a way of exploiting parallelism, instruction level parallelism. But to do so, we need a smart compiler that analyzes the source code and extract those instructions that are completely independent of each other and can be executed in parallel. This way it creates like a very long instruction that can be uh, issued and uh, at the same time and all operations can start their execution on whatever processing elements we have in uh, our processor. In the, in, in CIMD processing essentially is one single instruction that gets issued to the different processing elements and each processing element, as you see in the slide, operates on different uh, values, right? V0, VR1, VR2, and so on. Um, if you want to recap on very long instruction word architectures, go to lecture 19A. So let's continue talking about vector processors and let's start thinking about how to execute different programs in a vector processor. Uh, we are going to start very, very simple, as you see, with something like this code. It is just a for loop. What you see on the, on the screen is a, a completely sequential code, same as you can write in C, for example. It has a, it's a for loop with 50 iterations, and in every iteration, we read two elements from memory, uh, from arrays A and B. We add them, divide by two, and store the result in the corresponding position in array C. Right? So good thing uh, here is that the uh, computation in each of the iterations of this for loop is completely independent of the other uh, iterations, right? So there is where we have the data level parallelism and there is where we can definitely use a vector processor. Uh, in um, vector processors, we will have to access these elements from A and B and we need to have load and store units to do so, or we need to have our processing elements performing, executing load and store operations, and we need to store the data that we bring from memory. We need to store it somewhere in the vector registers, as you already know. Uh, we have to define what's the size of the SIMD operation that we want to execute. In principle, uh, we are going to assume that we can uh, define this vector length in software, but in reality, this vector length is going to be uh, determined by the size of our vector registers or the number of processing elements that we have in the system. We will talk about that uh, uh, in our GPU lecture. But for now, you can assume that you can configure the size of the SIMD operation. In this case, in our for loop, we have 50 iterations, so we will probably choose a vector length equal to 50. And also we have to access data uh, from memory or we have to write results to memory, right? And we, in principle, want to access many elements at the same time in parallel. Why is that? Because we are operating on many elements at the same time. So the way of calculating the addresses is based on a certain value that is called the stride. In the most simple case, you can just assume in this uh, example, for, exa um, for example, you can assume that we, uh, uh, the stride is equal to one because we access all elements of arrays A, B, and C. So first access is to A0, 
uh, A1, A2, and so on, right? And same, same for um, array B. So if you think about it, the distance between these consecutive accesses is only one. So that's the stride. But there might be completely different code, for example, where we just want to uh, operate on uh, odd uh, numbered or odd indexed uh, elements of the array. For example, if we have here uh, I plus two instead of I plus plus. So in that case, this stride would be two. We will see more examples. Well, actually we have the example here. Uh, um, uh, a good, a very um, commonly used kernel that is a matrix multiplication. Uh, for sure, you know how this works. Uh, you have two matrices, A and B, you want to multiply them. What you have to do is the dot product of one row of matrix A and one column of matrix B, right? So um, this is uh, where, this is uh, here on the right-hand side is how matrix A and B are laid out in memory. So, you know, uh, we are assuming a row major order um, uh, in the storage. What means is that uh, um, row, uh, so first of all, we have row zero, and then we have row one, and then we have row two, one after the other in memory, right? And that's uh, the same for array, for matrix A, and also for matrix B. If we want to perform the first dot product here, we access uh, row zero of matrix A, we access column zero of matrix B, and we go element by element, bring them from memory, multiply, and accumulate. That's what the uh, operation, operation essentially consists of. So uh, observe that there is a, there are uh, different ways of accessing both matrix A and matrix B. In case of matrix A, we access consecutive elements in memory because we first need to access element A0, then element A1, A2, and so on. While in B, the way we access is different. We access with a longer stride. In this case, this longer stride is 10 because we need to access first this um, element zero, then 10, then 20, and so on. So now you see what's the uh, difference in, or what are different uh, strides uh, to access memory. Good thing is that even though we are using different strides here, the computation is still regular, right? But there are some considerations to take into account when we access uh, memory. We will discuss them soon. Okay. So um, um, in a vector processor, a vector instruction performs an operation on each element in consecutive cycles. In the simplest case, uh, remember that uh, super simple vector processor with a single uh, processing element there, we start the execution of one addition every cycle, right? We go to uh, uh, register V0, register V1, re uh, take one element from here, one element from there, and uh, start the uh, addition, right? And that's possible because there are no intra-vector dependencies. Computation that we apply on element zero of array A and B is completely independent of the computation that we apply on element A1 and B1, right? And that allows us to have these different operations in the same pipeline. Remember when you have studied in order pipeline for, for the MIPS architecture, for example, remember that you need to control in some way the dependencies between different instructions. And at some point you may need to start the pipeline in order to finish one particular instruction that is creating one value that needs to be used by a later instruction, right? Here there are no dependencies because the operation that we perform on every pair of elements, A0 and B0, is completely uh, independent of other elements. So there is no control flow within a vector and also it's easy to access memory because we have a stride in the previous example, matrix multiplication, or a stride was one or a stride was 10. And if we know that the stride, we can easily calculate the addresses that we have to access from memory. And we can even prefetch data because we know what are going to be future accesses, right? So that's what uh, prefetching consists of. You will probably learn more about prefetching later in this course. So advantages of vector processors, there are no dependencies within a vector. So they are good for pipelining and parallelization. Uh, each instruction generates a lot of work. With one single instruction, you can operate in, uh, you can operate on how many elements? VLAN elements, right? The vector length, defines what's the number of elements that we operate at the same time on, and we only need a single instruction for that. So that's quite efficient because we don't have to go to the instruction memory all the time to fetch any instruction, right? It's one instruction for many, many data. <clears throat> 
there are no, no need to explicitly, explicitly code loops, at least in the beginning, right? In the previous example, we saw this for loop from zero to 49, 50 iterations. We just go and say, okay, my vector length is going to be 50. So I get rid of the uh, for loop uh, uh, at once, right? That's not, not, not always going to be the case. Uh, we will normally have uh, for loops as well, but in every iteration of the for loop, we are executing SIMD instructions. So we are operating on multiple data elements. So we don't need to have so many iterations of the for loop. And uh, usually uh, memory accesses will be, will be regular. However, vector processors are not so good when the parallelism is not so regular. Uh, in, that in those cases, they are more uh, inefficient as, you, as we will see. You have there one uh, example, how to search for a, a key in a linked list if uh, you have a vector processor. In the end, you will probably end up serializing the accesses and so on. There are workloads that are really suitable for vector and array processors for CIMD processing because they have a lot of regular data level parallelism. In other cases, that's not going to be that easy. And also uh, vector processors are uh, difficult to program. Why is that? Because you must ensure in your program that you are exploiting this regularity in the parallelism. And that's something that was pointed out by Fisher in 1983. We will talk about this uh, quote uh, later, actually tomorrow. And this is the uh, paper from Fisher. And uh, this is uh, another limitation of SIMD processor. It is Amdahl's law. You probably have heard of it uh, already. Amdahl's law essentially tell us that uh, if we have a parallel machine, the maximum speed up that we can obtain from our program depends on what's the fraction of parallel code and the, fra the fraction of serial code. And this fraction of serial code is the actual bottleneck uh, in our program, right? So of course, Amdahl's law is always limiting the uh, performance improvement that we can get from uh, parallel machines. But that's why it's also important to have heterogeneous computers. And that's why we have heterogeneous computers these days. Any of our uh, laptops, cell phones, etc., have uh, CPUs, GPUs, and other type of processors or accelerators. And this is uh, the paper from Amdahl. And also, if you want to learn more about the, you know, parallelism and heterogeneity, you can watch these lectures from Professor Mudlu from the Advanced Computer Architecture course, this one and also this one. Uh, one more limitation or one more drawback of vector processors, memory, the memory bandwidth can easily become a bottleneck, especially if either um, data is not you know, perfectly laid out in memory such that uh, all elements are that you're going to access are stored one after the other one uh, in, the, in the memory array, uh, or because we need to access much more, well, we need to access a lot of data from memory, but the amount of computation per uh, data element is very small. The, do you remember the, the example I gave you before, right? The vector addition. You have to access 1 million elements from array A, 1 million elements from array B, and the only thing that we are doing with uh, these two elements is just one single operation. So the arithmetic, the arithmetic intensity there is pretty low. It's just one single addition every two elements, and these elements might be, for example, uh, four bytes uh, each one. So it's one single addition every eight bytes. So that's uh, very low. Uh, arithmetic intensity. What happens in our programs is that they, the, the processors, the uh, processing units are going to be waiting all the time for data coming from memory. So memory bandwidth is uh, a typical limitation in CMD processors and GPUs. Okay, any questions so far? I guess super clear everything. So well, then we can continue. Uh, vector processing in more depth. So let's go a little bit more in depth uh, um, about vector processors. Remember that we have vector registers. Here is where we keep the operands that we use in different operations that we execute in the processing elements, but we also have important control registers. One, uh, first, uh, actually we have already talked about one of them is the vector length. We have to define what's the length uh, uh, of the, you know, the number of elements that we want to operate on at the same time. We also need to know the um, stride. Uh, we already talked about the stride, right? The distance between 
consecutive elements that are going to be uh, accessed from memory. And there is one more, is this vector mask register. This vector mask register is going to be useful whenever we need to uh, perform some sort of conditional execution. Imagine, for example, an if else statement. I want part of the vector execute the if a state, a statement, the other part execute the uh, else a statement. In order to do so, what I'm going to use is this mask. Uh, the mask is essentially a bitmap and I will have one zero or uh, I will have a zero or a one, depending on whether I'm going to operate at a certain time uh, on the uh, elements or uh, in, you know, in, the, in the vector array, right? So for example, if uh, the vector mask uh, is zero for uh, you know element zero in V0 and V1, then I don't do anything. If the vector mask value uh, or the, the, the bit in the vector mask uh, is, um, is one, then I will perform the operation. For example, the addition. I, we are going to see uh, more examples about this soon. Okay, and this is the, you know, like uh, how it looks a uh, vector functional unit. It has a uh, or can have a deep pipeline. Remember that this is possible because there are no dependencies across the uh, different uh, uh, elements that we operate on in the in the vector processor. In this uh, particular example, it's a six-stage multiply pipeline, right? So in every uh, single cycle, we fetch one element from V1, one, one element from V2, and start the addition, right? And one uh, every cycle, we fetch two elements, one start one addition or one multiplication in this particular case, and also one cycle, uh, cycle after cycle, we obtain one result that goes back to V3 to be uh, stored or temporary, temporarily stored. And this type of uh, uh, vector units, you can find them, for example, in this uh, figure here, you see here the vector units for addition, for logical operations, for shift operations, we also have uh, floating point units here and so on. This is the, um, uh, the picture of a, a Cray-1 computer system that was uh, presented in 1978. It's one of the, uh, probably if not the oldest uh, vector machine. It was the fastest machine uh, of its time and it's a, quite a good example of a vector processor. This is the paper and this is one uh, Cray machine that you can uh, visit here at ETH is actually in the CAB building. You have probably seen it already. And um, yeah, and, and you can you know, find also in this slide some information about it. Uh, observe how this one is, is actually, the, the scheme is very similar to the one for the Cray one, uh, even though this one is a little bit older, but uh, yeah, you have here uh, vector functional units, you have uh, vector registers, as you can see, and the many different components. And here you have uh, a little bit more information about the functional units and, and uh, memory configuration and so on. So these Cray systems were uh, designed and built by uh, the, the, the company led by uh, Seymour Cray. He's a, a pioneer in the high performance computing and uh, supercomputers. And this is an interesting and nice uh, quote from him. If you were probing a field which would you rather use, two strong oxen or 1,024 chicken? That depends on what you have to compute, right? So if you want to plow a field, you probably prefer the uh, strong oxen because they are designed to do so. But if you, for example, want uh, something like uh, obtaining many uh, units of food, at the same time, you probably prefer to have the 1,000 chickens because you will get at least one egg every day from, uh, from, from each of them, right? So it all depends on what you have to compute. Any questions there? Okay. Okay, so if you look at this uh, scheme of the uh, vector machine, you will see that it also has multiple memory banks, and we are going to uh, to, to see what these memory banks are, uh, I mean, what, what's, the, what's the goal of these memory banks? We need memory banks in vector processors when we have to operate, when we have to access uh, memory, when we need to load data from memory or store data uh, to memory. Um, you already know that elements are in memory, the elements that we need to access from memory, they are uh, separated by a certain certain constant instance that is called, called a stride. For now, we assume a stride equal to one. 
And now the question is, we want to access all elements at the same time, right? So for example, vector length is equal 50. So ideally we are going to get the 50 elements at once, right? Is that really possible if you have a single memory with a single port? It's probably not possible, right? Because uh, in the end, uh, it's, it's the same as having a single door, right? If you have a single door, then only one person can, can go through at the same time. If you want to have, uh, you know, like many, many people, many more people, you will, you will need multiple doors, so you will need a much wider door, right? So the way of obtaining this effect in vector processors is to bank the memory or interleave the elements across multiple memory banks. So your memory is not anymore going to be something like monolithic, like a huge memory array where you access one element after uh, element after element. And now we want to access multiple elements at the same time. So what we do is chopping the memory into multiple memory banks and having, as you see, uh, different ports in, uh, I mean, one, at least one port in each of the banks. As you can see here, they are sharing the data bus and the address bus, data uh, probably coming from the process, uh, processing elements when we want to write into memory. The addresses are the addresses that we, uh, the, the addresses of the elements that we need to read or write uh, for, uh, to memory. Uh, but um, but the, the idea here is that every single cycle, we can start the access to uh, one bank, even if we have the uh, address coming from, from here uh, in the address bus. So in the first cycle, we start the access to bank zero. In the next cycle, we start the access to bank one, the next cycle to bank two, and so on and so forth. And because probably the access to these banks is going to take longer than a single cycle, in the end, uh, we may be able to have uh, as many concurrent accesses as banks we have uh, in the memory, right? In this case, in this example, we have 16 banks, so we can sustain 16 accesses at the same time. And this is another view of the memory banks. As you can uh, see here, we have 16 banks and we need to have some uh, near each bank, we need to have a one port to access memory and we also need to have uh, address generator. Remember that generating the addresses in vector processors is very simple because we are using the stride, right? So we have a base address that is a, the, the pointer that the, the initial address of the array that we need to access from memory. And then we have the stride, either one or something else. Uh, every single cycle, we go to this address generator, we add the base address and the stride and we keep adding every cycle, right? In order to obtain the addresses that we need to uh, access from the, uh, from the different memory banks. Um, uh, here you have uh, like, um, um, you know, like um, how to say, like the conditions that must be satisfied in order to be able to sustain one element uh, per cycle. In the, in the uh, simplest case, we are assuming a stride equal one. We are also going to assume that consecutive elements are interleaved across banks. So observe that here we have 16 banks. So we assume that element A0 is here, element A1 is here, element A2 is here. Here we have element A15 and element A16 will be here, right? So that's why we, that, that's the way we normally interleave data uh, on the memory banks. And also one important thing is that the number of banks is greater or equal to the bank latency. Uh, if, uh, if that happens, then we will be able to sustain one uh, element per cycle because, for example, I mean, we, we, actually we are going to see it in, in, in later slides. But uh, so here, imagine that the access to each memory bank takes 11 cycles. So we start in cycle zero, we start the access to bank zero, 11 cycles later, we get one value from bank zero, right? But during these 11 cycles, we have been starting the accesses to the other banks. So as soon as we get el uh, the element from bank zero, one cycle later, we will get one element from uh, uh, bank one and so on. And this is the way of sustaining one element per cycle. So let's continue with our uh, simple uh, code. Remember the for loop from zero to 49, we read elements from A and B, we add them, divide by two, a store in Z, if you write the uh, scalar code, the serial code in some uh, ISA, for example, MIPS, 
uh, probably uh, it will look uh, like this more or less, right? Uh, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, to move 50 to some register to control how many iterations we perform in this for loop. Here in R1, 2, and 3, we are going to have the addresses to arrays A, B, and C, and then we perform the uh, uh, computation inside the uh, loop body. First of all, we access array A, then we access array B, then we add, then we shift right, it's the same as dividing by two, then we store, and then we uh, decrement the uh, index and, uh, and jump, right? And we have to do this 50 times. If you count the number of dynamic instructions that you execute in a CSD machine with this code, it will take uh, 304 dynamic instructions, right? That's clear. But um, also depending on how we access memory, even for this serial code, we might need to spend more or less cycles. For example, if we don't have memory banks, we have a single port to access memory. Remember only a single door in our room, we have to perform accesses to array, v, e, array A and then accesses to array B, right? So in total, this will take twice uh, the, the latency of, the, of every single memory access, right? So you can make your calculations and with, for the simplest case, you will need 2004 cycles to execute the code in the previous slide. Assuming that you can access two elements at the same time from the two different arrays, you can reduce this time, that for sure, uh, to uh, 1,504 uh, cycles, uh, but that would require that the memory is banked, is an interleaved memory. Uh, remember as well, as I explained, that uh, depending on what's the latency of the memory access, uh, we need a number of banks that is greater or equal to this number of uh, cycles, to this uh, latency. In our example, we are assuming uh, like uh, 11 cycles for every memory access, and we also assume 16 memory banks. But uh, the, the, this code that we have seen before, and we know how to write the serial code for this for loop, uh, can uh, be vectorized. Why is ca it can be vectorized? Because the computation on every iteration is independent on uh, independent of other iterations. So we can vectorize this code and we can write the corresponding SIMD program with using SIMD instructions. So first, uh, we have to set the uh, vector length equal to 50. We also set the vector stride is equal to one. Observe that because we are operating on accessing all the elements of arrays A and B. Uh, then we load elements from array A into vector register zero. Then we do the same for uh, array B. Then we perform the vector addition, uh, vector shift right, and then vector store, right? Now, how, so in total, we are already saving uh, a lot of effort here because remember this was 304 dynamic instructions for the serial code. Here, we only need seven dynamic instructions. That's the first ab advantage here. We are fetching uh, way less instructions from the instruction memory. We don't need to um, spend so much energy and resources in decoding instructions. So we are already making our computer more efficient. But let's see how this is executed in the simplest uh, vector processor that uh, we can uh, think of right now. Uh, it will be useful actually to have the uh, code here, but uh, let's very quickly go back. Remember, first instruction is a um, um, movie uh, length, vector length equal 50. This one takes uh, only one cycle. The second move instruction, only one cycle. The next instructions take longer, like uh, 11 cycles plus the vector length, 11 cycles plus the, plus the vector length and so on, right? So this is how it looks in the timeline. These uh, first two cycles correspond to the uh, move uh, the, for the vector length, move for the vector stride, and then we start the load, the vector load here. Why is this going to last 11 plus 49? Any guess? So 11 is because that's the latency of each memory access. If we start accessing element A0 from bank zero, we uh, you know, request the, 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 uh, the load operation. We, we start the load operation at a certain cycle, 11 cycle later, we will get uh, our value, right? So that's what this uh, 
11 cycles represent here. One cycle later, right after starting the access to bank zero, we start the access to bank one, and then we start the access to bank two, and so on, right, until bank 15. So uh, that means that after 11 cycles, we get the value from bank zero, and one cycle later, we get the value from bank one, and one cycle later, we get the value from bank two. So if we have to access 50 elements, in total, we need 11 cycles for the access to the first bank plus 40 more cycles for the remaining 49 elements uh, that we uh, want to access. So that's for the first vector load. Then we have the second vector load to uh, elements from array B. And once we have the 50 elements from A, the 50 elements from B, we can start the execution of the addition, then the execution of the shift operation, and finally the store. Observe that here, the uh, latency of the uh, a single addition is four cycles. So after four cycles, we get the first addition result, one cycle later, the second addition result, and so on. But this is not really, I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, already way faster than executing the, the, the serial code that we have seen before. This, this would only take uh, 285 cycles, but we can, make it even uh, more efficient. Why is that? Because observe that element A0 is ready right here. And element V0 is ready right here. So in principle, we could start the addition at this point, right? As soon as we get A0 and V0, we can start the addition. However, we have to wait until all the elements are in uh, vector uh, register zero and vector register one because the, uh, you know, the, the first uh, vector processor that we are considering here doesn't support chaining. What does it mean, chaining? Chaining means that as soon as we have uh, one data element that needs to be used by a different processing element, as soon as we have that value, we can forward this value, for example, from the load unit to the multiplier uh, in the same cycle, and we can start the execution of that particular vector instruction, in this case, a multiplication uh, in that cycle, right? And, and as soon as we have the result of the first multiplication, we can chain, uh, send this result, forward this result to the add unit and uh, continue the execution. And if we do so, that means that right after obtaining V0 from memory, we can start the execution of the addition. And right after finishing the uh, first addition, after obtaining A0 plus B0, uh, we can start the execution on the uh, shift unit and so on. So this way we save even more cycles, observe that we are making our vector processor more sophisticated, more complex, but also more efficient. This will take 182 cycles. But now even more optimization is what uh, can we do with the loads and the stores? For now, observe here, we have this vector load uh, from array B and this vector load from array A are completely independent, right? If my memory supports it, I could in principle access elements from A and B at the same time, why not? But to do so, I would need to have more than one port in memory, in each memory bank. I would need to have more than one gate in my room. So um, that's uh, what we can uh, do or we can get if we uh, assume, for example, two load ports and one store port uh, per bank. In this case, uh, we can overlap the execution of the vector loads here. And as soon as we get element A0 and element V0 here, we can start the uh, execution of the addition and so on. And we can even parallelize the uh, uh, or execute concurrently the uh, store operation for the elements that we have already calculated while we are still accessing elements from A and B, as you see here. In total, we can accelerate uh, the code a little bit more and uh, finally execute it in 79 cycles. So 19 times performance improvement. This would be the speed up with respect to the um, uh, serial version that we uh, saw in the beginning. Okay, um, I guess it's time for a short break. You want to have a 10 minute break? Okay, let's continue in 10 minutes.
question. Um, yeah, you said that we have 16 memory banks, but we've only used 11 there. No, we use the 16 of them. It's only that you need to have more banks than the latency of the access. To overlap. Because you overlap the accesses to the different banks, yes. But why do you need to overlap? So don't you change them uh, into register, uh, the memory? Yeah, but the way to do so is to, you know, you start the access to one bank, yeah. and right the, uh, one cycle later, you start the access to the next bank. So um, if, if you do so, after 11 cycles, you get one value from but, bank zero. Yeah, then it's guaranteed, but then you can override bank zero, right? And you wouldn't have to need to use the other five. You could use them for D, for example. I mean, now you, you said that uh, you have two ports per bank, mm -hmm. which is more hardware, mm -hmm. more cost, and mm -hmm. so on. But you could also change that the depends, banks. It depends as well on, on what your vector is, right? In the example that yeah. they are, of course, you have 50 elements. So, yeah. so you, you could also um, alternate between A and B, right? Mm -hmm. Without adding memory cost, to make it faster, very mm -hmm. difficult to mm -hmm. to do that with but a. How, how do you do that? Because how do you determine the how program, yeah. The programmer is writing a single instruction for the access. So it's it's very difficult to find out how you have to overlap that and you need to leave it. There are there. Are, uh, yeah, I mean, the, it's a good question. Actually, it doesn't really apply to the example that we are covering today because it's just one single instruction executed for all the accesses yes. to A and all the accesses to B. But for example, in GPUs, uh, your vector length is fixed, it's 32. Yeah. So if you have to operate on 64 elements, that means that you require two instructions for the first 32 elements, for the second 32 that, elements. That's very and nice. In this case, they are intermediate. Yeah, then you, could, you have a much higher latency, right? Uh, this, this, no much lower latency. You can, yes, this way you can hide the latency not only by accessing elements, and I know with my card, but, but also by, by executing instructions Where from we other we vectors. Like so we will call them warps. Yeah. 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 A warp is like 32 of these uh, okay. okay. My parents are coming from the temple, they didn't know. Uh, oh, okay. 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 Uh, I guess you want to see the presentation. No, it's okay. Uh, no, yeah, I, mean, I was almost going to leave. Yeah, yeah. And let's get to that chat as well. Yeah, because I didn't tell you. Tell them anything. I mean, if that is the case where uh, that you said, then you would only have 15 elements in your computers, right? That's not going to happen. Good security. Yeah. I need help from someone from one team. 
want me to write everything. I just need some. Uh, so I need to define. So I need to split the class for the before I do any analysis. Okay. So I have not so much more memory. Uh, up net current up net. Okay, that, that's 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 negotiable. Uh, you need to decide uh, what to the what. Yeah, so regardless of the so they need to generalize for up and it's not a generalization, but it's a subset of crushing here, the most crushing bands nearby. Okay, we are going to continue. Okay, um, yeah, be, before we we continue from where uh, from where we stop, let me very uh, briefly recap on how we access memory because I have received a couple of questions and I just want everyone to be on the same page. Uh, remember the idea of having multiple banks in memory is 
with the aim of sustaining multiple accesses at the same time. And we need that because we have many compute units that are ready to operate in parallel or in the you know, uh, minimal case, we will at least have like a very deep pipeline where we can start many different operations, uh, same instruction on different data elements every single cycle, right? That, uh, that's the reason, or these are the possible reasons why we may want to access multiple elements in parallel from memory. Accessing memory takes a lot of time, takes many cycles, right? And if we want to get elements, values from memory very quickly, let's say every cycle, it's better to divide our memory into different pieces. Each of these pieces is going to be called a bank and the size of this bank will depend on how large we want to make it, right? Imagine that the size of your uh, memory is uh, 10 megabytes, total size of your memory is 10 me megabytes, and you decide to build your, build your memory with 10 banks. In that case, every bank has one megabyte, right? That uh, must be clear now. So, and now another important thing is if I want to access all elements from one array or many consecutive elements from one array uh, from memory, and we want, I want to do all these accesses, accesses concurrently, what I will do probably is to uh, map the elements to the different banks in a linear manner. So I will have element A0 here, element A1 here, element A2, and so on. If I have 15 banks, here I will have element A15 and element 16, A16 will be again in bank zero. That's the normal way that we map addresses to the banks. That uh, should also uh, be clear now. And, and then after performing the access, every time I get, I'm reading from memory, right? So uh, after 11 cycles, I will have the value that I, want, that I wanted to read here in the memory data register, ready to be moved to the processor over this data bus. Where is this value going to be stored? It's going to be stored in one register of a vector register, right? So if I access, 10 elements or 16 elements from array A in a certain number of cycles, the 16 elements of array A will go to the same vector register, for example, V0, okay? Okay, I don't know if there are more related questions. Feel free to ask. If not, uh, I think we can uh, continue, uh, uh, you know, and, and I think we were in the next slide, but also very quickly here, uh, if we want to have more than one access to one bank, we need more than one port. Remember, in each bank, we have a memory address register. We have a memory data register. You can uh, see these two registers as the port. So if you want to sustain more than one access to every bank, you will need more than one memory address register and more than one memory data register. And that, those are what we call the ports in this slide, okay? Okay, so uh, let's uh, continue. Now, what happens if, because until now we consider that we can configure the vector length the way we want, right? But remember, in the end, the vector length is going to be determined by the size of the vector registers. In my, ve in my vector register, I may only be able to keep 32 elements. So that's essentially going to be my vector length because I cannot load more elements, more than 32 elements in V0 or in V1, right? So <clears throat> what do we do in case that we have to operate on an array that is way larger than, or a little bit larger than the maximum vector length that we can have in our system, in our SIMD processor. In that case, what we will do is breaking, uh, you know, like uh, breaking the uh, computation on the whole array into multiple SIMD instructions and we will in the end create a for loop in each iteration of the for loop. We execute one or several vector instructions or SIMD instructions. After we finish the loop, we go to the next elements. For example, if our vector length, length is uh, 64 and we have to operate on 527 data elements, we first access the first 64 elements, 
compute on them, write them back to memory, then we go to the next 64 elements and so on. And at the end, we will have probably some tail uh, in the last iteration. We don't have so many elements for the 64 lanes. We only use uh, 15 of them. This is what it's, it's called vector strip mining. It's essentially because of an uh, analogy with uh, strip mining, a, a type of uh, mining where you, 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 know, you start doing mining like layer by layer. It would be same as operating on uh, vector length by vector length. Okay, uh, more questions. What if the accesses to memory cannot be regular? Remember until now we said, oh, Let's try this one because we access all elements in array A, all elements in array B. Or let's try this 10 because we have to access elements in one column of matrix B to perform the matrix multiplication. In some cases, the accesses will be more complex. They will be irregular because not necessarily will be uh, consecutive accesses at a constant distance. That, that is what we call the stride. In that case, we have to use indirection in our accesses and we are going to talk about the scatter and gather operations. We talk about the scatter operation when we have a bunch of elements that, or bunch of values that we want to write in different locations in memory. And these locations might be completely random, completely irregular accesses. So if it's storing, we talk about a scatter. If it's uh, reading, if it's loading, we talk about gather. And what we will have to use is uh, like, uh, a, a vector that, uh, so another uh, array that contains the addresses, the indices that we want to access from memory. That's why we have to perform an indirect access. This array D contains the indices of array C where the elements that we want to use in our calculations reside. So, uh, or uh, SIMD processors, SIMD processor could uh, access array D in you know regular manner, just uh, in order to load the indices in the D vector in this uh, BD here, and then using BD and using RC that contains the initial address of array C, we perform here uh, some uh, calculation to obtain the uh, memory address and then uh, perform the accesses to uh, this uh, um, array C. Um, and, and, and keep and store the result, the values uh, in vector C. And, and we need to do this using this uh, indirect load. You are already familiar with indirect loads as well because you have studied them um, with the uh, MIPS instruction set. And, um, and these scatter and gather operations, this way of accessing memory using an indirect access and irregular accesses uh, are pretty useful when we operate, for example, on sparse data structures. Imagine uh, sparse uh, matrices, they may be of a size, uh, I don't know, 1 million times 1 million, but only 10% of the elements are non-zero elements, right? In that case, why do I want to store so many zeros if uh, I'm not going to use them? Even if I use them, one multiplication uh, by zero is equal zero, so it makes no sense to operate on them. So that's why we use compress matrix formats in order or compressed uh, vector formats in order to store um, sparse data in memory in a more efficient manner, saving uh, a lot of memory. But when we have to access those um, sparse uh, matrices or those sparse vectors, we need to perform indirect accesses. And here you have uh, one more example. You have uh, certain values uh, that you want to store uh, in memory, these values here, right? And where do I have to store them? In the addresses, addresses given by this index vector. In the example that we saw before, this one would be uh, array D, and this one would be array C, right? And this is a, a scatter example because it, we are writing, we are storing in memory. Okay, one more question. What happens if we want to have conditional execution, right? Until now, we considered our code was pretty simple. All 50 iterations of the for loop, we're just the same operation, right? We're just one addition and then shift right. Uh, but what happens if we don't want to operate on all, all elements of the arrays? For example, we only want to operate here, perform the multiplication if A uh, of I is, is not zero, right? So in this case, we are, is where we are going to use the mask. Remember that we have a mask, it's kind of a, a, a bit map and every single bit uh, tells me if I have to operate 
on the corresponding element or not, right? Um, so uh, what I would need to do if we want to, if I want to uh, write this code with uh, SIMD instructions is obtaining the mask. Observe how we are loading elements of A into V0. And here we compare these elements of in V0 to uh, constant zero. And based on that, we create the mask. If, if this is not zero, we will have one in the mask. If, it's, if uh, the value is uh, zero, then we will have um, uh, zero in the mask. And depending on that, the, those zeros and ones, the, 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 the subsequent um, instructions will be effectively executed or not, right? So here you have multiplication and a store. This is what we call conditional execution because it's based on uh, satisfying certain condition or predicated execution because we are predicating the execution to a mask bit. And here you have another example, in this case, more complex because we have if and else. We calculate the mask, first of all, comparing uh, the element of A and the element of B. We obtain the mask to, for, for, for this computation here. Uh, after uh, being done with the if statement, we complement the mask. We uh, flip all the bits in the mask, and then we uh, go to the second part, to the else. So that's a predicated execution. As, as, as we will see, uh, tomorrow, this is used by GPUs as well. There are different ways of uh, implementing uh, the mask ve vector instructions. Simplest way is this one on the slide. Uh, it's like you just do things as usual. You just perform the operation, let's say the multiplication, or let's say the addition, and only at the very end, depending on what's the value of the corresponding bit, you enable uh, the right operation or not. So it's like you write to the destination or not. In the end, uh, what's the advantage here is that you don't have to change anything in the pipeline because it operates as usual. What's the disadvantage? That we are operating on values that we don't really need, right? Uh, something more uh, sophisticated and hopefully more efficient is this density time implementation. Before we start, we scan the mask. We see in this mask of uh, zeros and ones, where do we have the ones? And we only execute the operations where the uh, corresponding you know, lane is active. Which one is better? That's for you to think about it, right? I already mentioned like, some advantages of this or and disadvantages. Okay, some issues, straight and banking. We have already talked about banks, right? You know that banks are there because we want to sustain multiple accesses at the same time. Hopefully in order to get one new value every cycle, right? But that will happen if I can really access all banks in parallel. For sure, I can do that if the stride is equal one, because if the stride is equal one, I can access element zero in bank zero, element one in bank one, and so on, right? But sometimes I'll have different strides. Imagine that um, I uh, want to access only element zero, two, four, and so on. And I want to access 16 elements at the same time. In every bank, I mean, in each bank, I will have an access or not. I have accesses in uh, even number banks. What, means, what that means is that uh, accessing element uh, 16 will require me to go also to bank zero, same as uh, when I go to get uh, element A0. So those are the problems that we have when uh, the stride and the number of banks are not prime and uh, not relative prime, as you can see. And this is uh, something that uh, we can also see in the example of the matrix multiplication, right? Remember in this example, I have different uh, uh, strides for the access to matrix A and for the access to matrix B. Imagine that I only have 10 banks in my memory. If I only have 10 banks in my memory, that means that this element is in bank zero, this element is in bank one, this element is in bank two, and so on, right? And for matrix B, this element is in bank zero, this element is in bank one, this element is in bank two, and so on. And this element is in bank zero again, and this element as well, and this element as well, right? You now see the problem. When I want to access 
elements of the row of matrix A, there's no problem because I'm accessing elements that are in consecutive banks. However, if I have to access elements in column uh, zero of matrix B, I will have to go to bank zero and then to bank zero and then to bank zero and so on. So all the accesses are serialized. And why is that? Because the stride in this case is not prime relative to the number of banks. Actually, in the, in the example that I just gave you, the stride is exactly the same as the number of banks. What that means is that we have bank conflicts and we have to serialize the accesses to the bank, to the bank, right? And in this case, uh, bank zero. There are ways of uh, trying to solve or minimize at least these uh, bank conflicts. First uh, way of doing so, instead of having 10 banks, I can have 20 banks or I can have 30 banks or I can have 40 banks, right? That's the most straightforward solution but for sure it will improve my performance, right? Uh, but it's expensive because I need more banks. I need more ports. I need more hardware in the end. Uh, I can have more ports in each bank. Instead of having a single bank, a single port per bank, I can have two or I can have four or something like that. Again, the drawback is that I need more hardware, so it's more costly. Another possible way is to uh, come up with a better data layout. For example, matrix B. One thing we could do with matrix B is transposing it. Now the columns are rows. And now when I have to perform the execute the dot product of row of A and column of B, now I'm reading linearly both matrix A and both matrix B because what was a column of matrix B now is a row the way it's laid out in memory, right? So we can improve the layout of the data structures in order to have better access to memory, but that's not always, always going to be have, uh, easy. Another possibility is to change the mapping of addresses to the bank. Right now, the only way I told you that we can map addresses to the banks is linearly, right? A zero goes to bank zero, A one goes to bank one, and so on. One thing we could do is based on each index, we could use this index, uh, uh, the, use this index, index as the input to a hash function. And this hash function will give me the address that I have to access in memory. Creating a hash function is relatively uh, easy if you use XOR operations and you use different bits of the index. And this way, uh, we will probably see uh, more examples about this uh, later. Actually, we will mention this again tomorrow. Uh, but, um, but yeah, by, use, by doing that, by using these hash functions, I can randomize or pseudo randomize the mapping. And this way I can have uh, more, I can avoid, avoid many of these bank conflicts that I mentioned as the, the example of the uh, column of matrix B. Right? And this was first proposed in 1991 by uh, Bob Rao, and this is the uh, paper, for sure, uh, recommended reading. Okay, so um, yeah, let's start uh, summarizing more or less. Today's lecture, we have uh, talked, or we are talking about SIMD processors. We have seen that there are like two, let's say, uh, different types uh, or classes of uh, SIMD processors, array and vector processors. In reality, uh, there is no processor that is only vector or only array. They are more like a combination of both. And actually, uh, GPUs are a good example of that. And we will see uh, why in, today, in tomorrow's lecture. Um, here you see, uh, let's say, key differences between array and vector processor. The array processor, we have an array of processing elements. Each of them is able to execute different types of instructions. So this way we, have, we can have different operations in the same space and the same operation at the same time. While in the uh, vector processor, we assume that the, either there is a single uh, processing element or we may have more than one processing element, but they are, as you see, specialized for uh, some uh, sort or some type of instruction. As I told you, I will uh, give you uh, examples uh, of this type of processing elements in, in GPUs tomorrow. So how do we execute the instructions? Imagine that we have this vector add that will depend on how many functional units we have, how many execution units we have. We may have a very simple vector processor like this one. It only has 
one single execution unit. So what that means with a very deep pipeline, like three stages at least. So um, every single cycle, we start one addition, element zero plus A0 plus B0, one cycle later, A1 plus B1 and so on. If we have more <clears throat> than one execution unit, we can operate on more elements at the same time. So in this case, we are exploiting parallelism both in space and in time. But as you see, in the end, it's exactly the same program or exactly the same instruction, depending on how the uh, hardware is built, we can be faster or uh, slower. Uh, in this uh, slide, what you see are the different functional unit. Uh, when we talk about functional unit, we mean like, for example, one multiplier, one other that operates at the same time on multiple elements. Uh, that's why you see uh, several of these processing elements. All of them are one SIMD unit or one SIMD functional unit. And, uh, and these uh, processing elements, this is probably a multiplier, this is probably another, they access uh, data from the vector registers. And all these vector registers are in a large register file that is partitioned such that, uh, you know, corresponding uh, um, uh, parts of the vector registers are connected to the corresponding processing elements, as you see here. Uh, when we talk about lane, we are talking about uh, you know, uh, uh, every uh, uh, register inside a vector register and every, uh, uh, every processing element inside a functional unit. So this is what we call a vector lane. If we go back to the previous slide, you'll see that here, our vector processor has one single lane while here we have one, two, three, three, four vector lanes, right? And here we also have four vector lanes. So now let's uh, see how we execute instructions. If we have a certain number of vector lanes and we define or we determine the uh, uh, vector length as something different. In this example, we are assuming that we have 32 elements per vector register. So you can assume that the vector length here as defined by the program is uh, v length equal 32, but we only have eight lanes uh, in each of these load, multiply, and add unit. So how do we execute the 32 operations in only eight lanes? We will do something like this, right? In one cycle, we start the execution on eight elements, next cycle on the next eight elements, next cycle on the and the next eight elements, right? And one cycle later, we can start the operation on the matrix, uh, sorry, multiply, uh, multiply unit, the add unit, and then another load instruction, and then another multiply instruction, and then another add instruction. And this is how we are exploiting the concurrency with different, a number of lanes that is different from the vector length. <clears throat> okay, um, yeah. Uh, uh, luckily, uh, these days compilers are able to even extract uh, parallelism, data parallelism by themselves and vectorize code automatically, right? So that requires uh, some analysis of the, of the uh, scalar code that the programmer might have written, but the uh, compiler by doing uh, some uh, compile time analysis and, 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 and doing uh, a loop dependence analysis is able, might be able to create uh, vector instructions out of uh, sequential code. We will talk more tomorrow about this uh, automatic code vectorization, same as we will talk as well about different ways of writing our programs. In principle, we are assuming um, sequential code or we are assuming um, um, vector code. We have seen some examples of, let's say, SIMD uh, instructions. We will see different ways of writing programs tomorrow and we will relate these different ways of writing programs with the way they are executed on the underlying hardware. Um, yeah, so in summary, vector and CD machines are good at exploiting uh, regular data level parallelism, same operation performed on many data elements. Uh, this is good to improve performance and simplify the design because we just need to decode one single instruction to operate on multiple data elements. Uh, of course, the performance improvement of, or the speed of our program is uh, limited by the vectorizability of the code of, of uh, in the end, Amdahl's law. And that's why uh, you know, uh, it's important to have machines, processors that are good, are good at you know, heterogeneous workloads. Uh, one uh, good example was the Cray-1 machine, uh, Seymour Cray knew that, uh, that 
knew what was the bottleneck of his spiral machine, and that's why the Cray one was also the faster scalar machine uh, at its time. Uh, there, uh, CIMD processors exist nowadays. I mentioned today several times GPUs. We will cover them in detail tomorrow. But they, uh, we have uh, CIMD extensions in uh, different processors, in x86 processors, for example. We have these uh, MMX or SSSE or AVX. Um, we are going to uh, talk about them very quickly now. But um, yeah, as you see, uh, CIMD processors are extremely important these days. Uh, not only because they are in every single computer these days, but the reason why they are there is because they are useful to accelerate important workloads. In the beginning of the lecture, I mentioned images, image processing, video processing, computer vision can benefit from uh, parallel processors, from CIMD machines. Uh, more recently, we have seen the rise of uh, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, neural networks, all of them uh, can benefit from uh, CMD processors and uh, data level parallelism. And this is uh, Amdahl's law, as you remember, uh, uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, the bottleneck is the, is the serial portion. And, um, and yeah, and that's all for now. Let me uh, continue very quickly with, before we uh, finish the lecture uh, with uh, CMD operations in modern ISAs. I mentioned, uh, in the previous slide that uh, CIMD extensions exist in, uh, in many different processors these days. I mentioned the example of MMX instructions in Intel processors, and this actually started uh, back in the early 90s uh, with uh, this uh, work, uh, MMX technology uh, presented, I mean, this is a paper in IEEE Micro uh, uh, in 1996 is one of the, is, is the, one of the recommendings, recommending, uh, recommended readings of this lecture. So here, uh, the idea or, or the idea that um, uh, Intel uh, folks had is uh, there, are, there is a new type of workloads that are becoming very popular. These are multimedia workloads, and it turns out that multimedia workloads can benefit from data level parallelism. We have images, images have pixels, and we can operate on many pixels at the same time. And also there is uh, one more thing, pixels might not require very long data types like 32 bits or 64 bits or something like that. We usually have much lower uh, pixel uh, depth, right? We, let's say uh, um, uh, with uh, like, uh, eight bits or 12 bits is probably enough to uh, have uh, enough different colors for uh, each pixel, right? So um, they, they thought, okay, why don't we go and simply divide or compute units in a way that instead of operating, instead of performing one addition of two 64-bit elements um, in, in, in this uh, uh, compute unit, uh, this ALU, let's say, uh, what we do is that I um, disconnect the carry every eight bits, for example, and instead of performing one single addition on two 64-bit elements, I operate at the same time on uh, eight elements of eight bits. And that's uh, what the MMX technology proposes, is like using the 64-bit registers to either operate on either one uh, element of uh, 64 bits, as you see here, or two elements of 32 bits, or four elements of 16 bits, or eight elements of eight bits, right? For example, uh, pixels with, um, uh, you know, eight, eight bit pixels, uh, 256 uh, possible different values. And here you have a nice example about how to use these MMX instructions. Imagine that you want to overlay uh, the the uh, you know uh, that human the, the image of a human on, on top of a, a background. This is a, 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 a the the image with the uh, with the human has a blue background, and here we have a blossom background. And this is uh, the new image uh, that we want to obtain, right? If we as, uh, perform the serial execution of this operation, we will go pixel by pixel. We check the value of the pixel. If it's blue, we replace it with the pixel from the background, if it's not blue, then we just keep the pixel from the human, right? And we can perform all these uh, 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 iterations of the for loop in parallel. And if not all of them, at least as many as we can fit 
in, uh, in my vector registers, right? So here the vector register, we assume that it has uh, eight elements, it's of length equal eight. So uh, in my program, the first thing I would do is reading uh, pixels from uh, image X, comparing them to the value blue, and based on that, I uh, create a bit mask, right? And now if I have this bit mask, and by using uh, logic operations and operations, for example, and uh, and and not operation, which is the uh, the one uh, here. Uh, what 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 I can do is like filtering those pixels that I really need in this uh, uh, register uh, vector register MM4, and um, and same for the woman's image. So I filter. I, I essentially complement the mask and then uh, apply the filter. And these are the pixels from the woman that I need to use. And finally, and with an OR operation, I uh, uh, combine pixels from both image, images and obtain the uh, final uh, image. And here you can uh, see the code and you can find more explanations in the uh, corresponding paper. And these uh, SIMD extensions continue evolving over time. Um, uh, MMX, uh, as you have seen, was released in the uh, in the 90s, but after that, uh, Intel released the streaming CMD extensions. They increased the length of the vector, first 228, then to 256, and they also enable more functionality, for example, shuffle operations that allow you to move uh, values from one vector lane to another vector lane inside the same vector. Those are the uh, shuffle operations. Uh, here you see uh, next generation was the advanced vector extensions. Most recent ones here uh, among the AVX are AVX 512. Now the vector length is 512 bits. And more recently, they released um, specialized extensions for AI and machine learning. Uh, now registers are two dimensional because the idea is to perform matrix multiplication. Matrix multiplication, I think I mentioned it before, is like a key operation for artificial intelligence and neural networks. So now they have this uh, tile matrix multiply unit that is essentially a, a, a SIMD uh, unit as well, but uh, def uh, designed to operate on tiles of a matrix. And these are not the only examples in real world architectures. Uh, in, uh, as I mentioned before, they uh, SIMD processors are extremely relevant to machine learning and we see how uh, many deep learning accelerators, like for example, the uh, Cerebras wafer scale engine, in the end are essentially CIMD machines inside. Um, as you can see, actually, the way that we, so uh, the, the uh, Cerebras engine, as you know, is like a huge wafer that is divided into multiple tiles. You have a lot of compute power there, so you can uh, even execute a whole uh, network, a whole neural network on the uh, available tiles one thing that you would need to do is designing what's going to be the root of the uh, different layers of the neural networks when they are mapped onto the available tiles. In the end, we end up uh, operating on this wafer scale engine as if it was a MIMDI machine. Why is MIMDI? Because we are uh, executing different streams of instructions on different streams of uh, data, right? Instructions themselves are representing the uh, uh, different layers of the neural network and the data that flows over all the different uh, tiles and all the different layers is the, you know, the feature maps that go uh, through the neural network. Uh, and yeah, and then here you have again the uh, classification from Fling. Uh, so for uh, SIMD and MIMD machines as uh, good examples uh, that we can find here in the uh, Cerebras wafer scale engine. And actually this MIMDI machine is built uh, from, uh, by using SIMD processors. So uh, here in this slide, you see the wafer scale engine is divided into multiple dies and the, each die is divided into multi multiple tiles and each tile is something like this. And if we take a closer look at the tile, what we see is that the tile is essentially a SIMD processor. As you see, is a four-way uh, SIMD processor that operates on 16-bit floating point values, uh, performing a fuse multiply accumulate operation that is key operation in matrix multiplication or convolution that are um, the you know, basic 
uh, primitives uh, for uh, artificial intelligence and neural networks. And here you have the address registers to access this local memory, it's uh, SRAM memory and, um, and, yeah, and the uh, FMAC units. And if you want to learn much more about this architecture, probably you have uh, already watched this, but if not, uh, you still uh, can do it in, 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 you know, in that link of uh, YouTube. I think I was super efficient. Uh, yeah, I had to, I had to fetch only a very few instructions and then throw a lot of data on you. And now you have to process with your vector registers. We will continue tomorrow. Thank you, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>